Heart to Heart, a Catholic media ministry, presents Good News Today, featuring an inspiring gospel teaching by Father Jim Willig. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus stood before the governor, Pontius Pilate, who questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. And when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they are testifying against you? But he did not answer him one word, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now on the occasion of the feast, the governor was accustomed to release to the crowd one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had assembled, Pilate said to them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had handed him over. While he was still seated on the bench, his wife sent him a message. Have nothing to do with that righteous man. I suffered much in a dream today because of him. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas, but to destroy Jesus. The governor said to them in reply, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They answered, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. But he said, Why? What evil has he done? They only shouted the louder, Let him be crucified! When Pilate saw that he was not succeeding at all, but that a riot was breaking out instead, he took water and washed his hands in the sight of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. Look to it yourselves. And the whole people said in reply, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But after he had Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus inside the praetorium and gathered the whole court around him. They stripped off his clothes and threw a scarlet military cloak about him. Weaving a crown out of thorns, they placed it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat upon him and took the reed and kept striking him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him off to crucify him. And when they were going out, they met a Cyrenian named Simon. This man they pressed into service to carry his cross, And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he had tasted it, he refused to drink. After they had crucified him, they divided his garments by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And they placed over his head the written charge against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and the other on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God and come down from that cross. Likewise, the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him and said, He saved others. He cannot save himself. (laughs) So he is the king of the Jews. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. The revolutionaries who were crucified with him also kept abusing him in the same way. 
From noon onward, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, This one is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran to get a sponge. He soaked it in wine and, putting it on a reed, gave it to him to drink. But the rest said, Wait! Let us see if Elijah comes to save him. But Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, rocks were split, tombs were opened, and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming forth from their tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. The centurion And the men with him who were keeping watch over Jesus feared greatly when they saw the earthquake and all that was happening. And they said, truly, this was the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. This passion narrative was probably the part of the gospel that was most proclaimed by the early apostles following Jesus' resurrection. So as we look at this today, we're looking at the core of our faith. As I've already said, it seems to be a more manageable way of presenting this is to divide it into three of the scenes of the passion that I picked because each of them have the beautiful character of Peter in each of them that we can so quickly, easily identify with. And I would begin with the Last Supper scene. As you would recall, it was there and then that Jesus said to his disciples, this night all of you will have your faith shaken and you will abandon me. Peter, as we know him to be, one to loudly and proudly speak up, boast, Lord, though all would have their faith shaken in you, mine will never be shaken. Don't you love Peter? What we see here, and what I like to suggest, is that Peter is in denial from the very beginning, denying this part of himself. He's denying his own weakness and sinfulness. This sense of pride that filled Peter with an inflated view of himself. And Peter was not in touch with that. So he was in denial. But Jesus, who saw through it, said, Peter, I give you my word. Before the cock crows tonight, you will deny me three times. Peter can't hear it. He says, Lord, though I would have to die for you, I will never disown you. Wow. You know, Jesus is saying, Peter, get real. And Peter is caught up in the ideal. Wow, can I relate to that? Let me speak about this cock crow that is such a beautiful symbol in this gospel. The cock crow was the sign of the end of night and the beginning of a new day. So on one level... Jesus was simply saying, Peter, before the night's over, you will have denied me three times. But on a whole other level, a more symbolic level, the cock crowing was announcing like an alarm clock, a wake-up call. This would be Peter's wake-up call to what? To seeing himself, to who he truly was, and where he fell so far short in his relationship, his discipleship with Jesus. This cock crowing would be a rude awakening to a Peter who was fallen asleep to something deep inside himself, the very spirit of the Lord. 
Because for us, this is what truly must happen, especially this Holy Week. We must sound the wake-up call across this country to wake up to the things we have fallen asleep to, that is, become unconscious of, which is our very sinfulness. We don't even see it anymore. We're not even aware, awake to it all. We've got to wake up. Amen? This is what we need to ring true across this country in our society today. We have fallen asleep to what the Lord is saying and wanting to do in our lives. This is the rooster that must crow today. We switch the scene now from this prediction of Peter's denial into the garden. Immediately following this alarm that that Jesus tries to sound in Peter's heart and mind and soul, but he doesn't get it. They move into the garden. Now pay attention to what happens in the garden because it's a living out of what I've already spoken about, Peter not being awake to. Jesus goes to this place called Gethsemane. Jesus chose this spot often to go to retreat with his disciples. It's no surprise he would go here this night before he died to choose that place of prayer so that he could gather the spirit that would strengthen him to undergo the cross that was before him. As I remember visiting this place of Gethsemane, I remember what one of the scripture scholars taught us there and then, that in all probability, what Jesus endured that night was a total breakdown. He was crushed mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I suspect that that kind of terrible brokenness was felt even more agonizing way in excruciating way, even more than the physical pain he was to endure, was the emotional abandonment he felt from God. Remember, God, where are you? He was praying to God that he would hear his prayer, but no, God seemed so distant. And yet, even if that isn't bad enough, but he called forth his friends. Why did he ask his disciples to be with him? Because he needed them in that dark hour when he was filled with doubt and worry and pressure that was falling upon him, he, like us, human in every way but sin, needed the support of his friends. He could see him gathering and inviting his closest disciples and friends, Peter and James and John, as he said to them, as we hear in the Passion reading, My heart is nearly broken with sorrow. Remain here and stay awake with me. I'd like to highlight those words, stay awake with me. As I will say, this will be the very last request that Jesus asked of his disciples. Then and here and now today. So we need to know what does it mean to stay awake with the Lord. But what does that mean? I would say we can tell what stay awake means if we look to Jesus and we can see what to fall asleep means if we look to Peter and the disciples. So we look to Jesus to find first, what does it mean to stay awake? Of course, it means so much more than just staying awake physically. It means more so spiritually. But what does that mean? To be awake and aware of what? Of God's presence and God's will, and God's working, and God's response, and God's strength, and God's grace that's always present to us who are present to the Lord. So Jesus falls prostrate. There's such a a powerful message here in the very posture of prayer that Jesus takes. He falls prostrate. You see how he's given totally to surrendering his life over to the Father. He says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I hear Jesus crying that out, don't you? So what is Jesus awake and aware of? His own feelings. And he's not afraid to pray out of that fear that he feels. That's how we need to pray. And yet, he's also awake to the fact that he's not living his own life but his Father's will. He's only here to accomplish the Father's will. So he says, but let it be as you would have it, not I. There's a man 
Jesus, who is totally aware of God's will and living out that mission he had been given. The scene immediately flashes now back to the disciples. Remember Jesus' last request, his only request, stay awake. And what does he do? He finds them asleep. And he says to Peter specifically, Peter, so you could not stay awake for even an hour? Now think of that hour being the hour of darkness, the hour of suffering, the hour is that significant moment where we experience this call of Christ to be alive, awake to what he's asking of us. Jesus is calling them to a vigil of prayer, even more to a prayerful vigilance, you see. But the disciples are not aware and awake to Jesus' agony or to their responsibility to be attentive and supportive to their Lord. Gosh, how I often think of this scene when I sit in my office to listen to people's pain and problems and hear how their closest spouse or friends or children or parents aren't at all aware what's going on. And and I say, wow, how many of us are still today sleepwalking with our own families, among our own friends, because we're not really awake to what's going on deep inside of ourselves and in each other. Jesus is enduring his suffering this day. When we sing, were you there? What is our response? Were you there when Jesus went through his agony? We must say yes, because his agony is going on in the agony of the body of Christ today. If we don't see it, then we're asleep. So we need to wake up to the pain and the passion of Christ that's happening even as we speak today. Jesus says, again, stay awake and pray with me. And again, he withdraws and prays, my father, if it cannot pass without my drinking this cup, this cup representing what, think on terms of the mission he's been given, but even more symbolic is the cup that he had already offered at the Last Supper that wine that would become his blood, that would become the sacrifice poured out on the cross, that's already being poured out. And then again he returns. Again, you have the stark contrast with Jesus, who's so intensely awake and aware of God's will, to the disciples, where he again finds them asleep. And Matthew says, they could not keep their eyes open. What couldn't they keep open? They couldn't keep their heart open, their mind open, their spirit open. Just like we have a hard time opening our eyes to the real suffering going on around us. Again, Jesus calls them to stay awake. He returns to pray a third time and then returns again to the disciples and says, Well, sleep on now. What a sad commentary that the disciples who were trained all these years to learn how to be with Jesus could not really be with him in the hour of greatest need. And so finally Jesus says, all right, get up. But this final wake up call, get up, you guys. Let us be on our way. Behold, our betrayer is at hand. Take notice here that three times the disciples were asked by Jesus to stay awake. Three times they were unable to be faithful to his request. And three times they hit, if you will, the proverbial snooze button to the alarm. Just as three times now we will hear Peter again denying Jesus. But see where this denial actually began, way back. Just as this denial spiritually happens first inside ourselves, you could almost see that this would be inevitable, almost predictable, what was going to happen, because it was happening deep inside them already. So we shift then to Peter's denial as Jesus was then abducted by the soldiers out of the garden, taken across the Kidron Valley to the place called Caiaphas, the high priest's house, where prisoners were often taken and held hostage. And Peter follows him, but we're told he followed him at a distance. Again, I'd like to highlight that. At a distance, Peter, you know, was 
one who truly tried to be a follower of Jesus. And yet, we see him following him still at a distance. Trying to follow through on his promise to be faithful, even to death. You have to hand it to Peter, at least he tried. Or where are the other disciples? They're not even coming close. Now again, we can identify with Peter as we try to see, and how do we try to follow Jesus? I often think that Jesus has lots of fans and many friends, but few followers. Lots of fans, many friends, but few followers who follow him all the way, all the way to laying their life down, all the way to the, where the gospel challenges us and calls us to sacrifice ourselves. We like to keep a safe distance. Maybe that's why people at church usually tend to sit in the back. I don't know. But we like to keep a certain safe distance. Many of us even try not to get too close to other people. Isn't that true in life? Because we're afraid of what love would demand of us if we got too close. And many of us even keep a certain distance from our own feelings, from our own families, because of the ways that can cause to task in terms and in ways we're not prepared to respond. So do you see Peter at a distance from Jesus? But nevertheless, give it to Peter. Give him this much. He's trying. He really is trying. Like us here, we're trying. You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't come this far. You wouldn't be wanting to, to study the Gospels if we weren't in some way given to promising to follow Jesus. And this is good. This is a start. And yet, in this courtyard, we see Peter, who's approached by one of the servant girls, and they say, you were with Jesus of the Galilean. Now remember, to be a disciple is to be one with and Peter says in front of everybody, and that's an important point, in front of everybody, he says, I don't know what you're talking about. Again, we see the stark comparison between Jesus' heroic courage to be the Son of God and for which he will be crucified, his heroic courage compared to Peter's horrific cowardice that says, I, I don't know him. No. It says, in effect, saying, I don't have any relationship or commitment to this man. Another servant girl approaches Peter, but this time, first we see Peter in the courtyard, and next time we see him at the gate. So what's happening here? Because the third time we're going to see him running out. There's this movement from being at least a little close to Christ, but moving further and further away. Those are beautiful points to pick up in this Passion reading. Matthew's picking up on these symbols, okay? As we tend to distance ourselves when things get tough. And it becomes more evident and clear what the commitment will move. And so, Peter at the gate, moving further away, is approached again. And this time, he swears under an oath. I don't know the man. The point is powerfully understood that Jesus taught you should never swear under any oath. Say yes if you mean yes, no if you mean no. This is said earlier in Matthew's Gospel. He's calling down God to be his witness. Isn't this odd? That he would swear at that moment the false thing, the worst kind of perjury against his own friend, his own master. And yet you see what is Peter denying? He's not only denying Jesus, he's denying who he is. He's denying everything that meant anything to him, Jesus Christ. And so a third person comes up to him and says, I know you are one of his followers. And Peter says in the most uncertain terms, I don't even know the man. What I read and researched and discovered is that very phrase, I don't know the man, is a Semitic expression and the implication that to know means I don't have anything to do with him. He means nothing to me. To know means to have intimate relationship, all right? Don't know means no connection, no commitment, no concern at all. Imagine Peter saying that. When, as I say, he's denying everything about who he is and who he said he was. 
Don't we do this sometimes? When we, our actions betray our very words. Don't we do that sometimes? In the infidelities, in the little ways in our marriages, they don't have to be necessarily sexual affairs. They can be in many ways insensitivities. When we are not attentive and sensitive to our spouse, our children, to especially what God is asking of us, and we, in effect, deny the fact we're Christian, which means to be given to love, to be faithful as friends, and to be true as family. And at that moment, when Peter just washes his hands completely of Jesus, as Pilate will later do as well, cock crows. And here is the alarm that loudly goes off in Peter's mind. This is Peter's rude awakening. In this moment, he is totally awake and aware to what has happened, to what he has done. Now he knows his own sinfulness, his own weakness, his own humanness, something Jesus had always known, had always seen, had always accepted. But Peter never could. He never could. And so now Peter breaks down. But what breaks down? That super ego that I say had to die along with Jesus at that place. And paradoxically, this death of Peter in his denial would become the greatest occasion of his own resurrection, his own transformation, his own conversion. Peter will be a new man later when he is open to receive Jesus' forgiveness. Heart to Heart welcomes you back next week for another inspiring edition of Good News Today. If you are interested in other books, CDs, DVDs, or digital downloads by Father Jim or Father Michael, you can call toll-free 1-877-208-4875 or visit our website, www.heartoheart.org. There, you can also sign up to receive a weekly reminder to listen to these same programs online. And please, consider a donation of any size to help support Heart to Heart's radio and internet ministry. That's www.heartoheart.org or call 1-877-208-4875. Thank you for listening and may God bless your heart and the hearts of all of your loved ones. Heart to heart, hand in hand, praying for grace to understand, Spirit of Jesus, open